Coming up on DTNS, our take apart laptops, the next trend, the truth about Facebook's newsfeed, and is our password free future finally here? DTNS starts now. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, September 15th, the Ides of September 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were just talking about our dreams. Not our hopes, just our dreams. If you want that wider conversation, get our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. That is where you can join our top patrons like Mark Gibson, Reed Fischler, and Michelle Sergio. Yay. All right, let's start with a few tech things you should know. Amazon now offers Prime members in the UK and Ireland access to Deliveroo Plus for a year. This will provide free food delivery for orders over 25 pounds, the currency of the weight of the food. Amazon has roughly a 12% stake in Deliveroo. Protocol sources say Comcast will launch its own X-Class branded smart TVs manufactured by Hisense. Hey, if Amazon can do it, Comcast can do it too. These 4K TVs will come in 43 and 50 inches, run Comcast's X1 operating system, the same one found on its set-top boxes, and include a voice-controlled remote. The Wall Street Journal previously reported Walmart will sell these TVs, but we don't have a large data pricing yet. Xiaomi announced its 11T series of phones. The top-end 11T Pro comes with a Qualcomm 888 system on a chip, 120 hertz OLED screen that supports Dolby Vision, and a 5,000 milliamp hour battery with support for 120 watt fast charging, able to go from zero to full in a claimed 17 minutes. Hmm. The standard 11T comes with a MediaTek Dimensity 1200 Ultra SoC and supports 67 watt fast charging. The budget 11 Lite 5G NE comes with a Snapdragon 778 and one would assume more pedestrian charging speeds. The 11T Pro starts at 649 euros, the 11T at 499 euros, and the 11 Lite at 369 euros. Though no release dates, but all models will come to European markets. Nintendo added Bluetooth audio support to the Switch in a new software update, now supporting using Bluetooth headphones to listen to your audio on the portable console. The Switch can only use two wireless controllers when using Bluetooth audio, though. Keep that in mind. And Bluetooth microphones are not yet supported. With the release of version 14 of the Unicorn, Unicorn, Unicode standard, we got 37 new emoji. Some might say you would want some unicorns, but uh, what you do get is a biting lip, a troll, a saluting face, mm. a pregnant person, the ever important heart hands, and support for mixed skin tones for handshake are among the additions. You could do, do we have an emoji for heart on top of your head where you do the heart, full heart? Thing? That's coming. It's coming yeah. next. Yeah. You got to yeah. be biting your lip at the same time, I think. And <laughs> yes, there is a unicorn emoji, but we could always use more. Uh, let's talk about modular laptops. We mentioned Intel's NUC for laptops earlier this week, and our producer, Rich, uh, and a few of you all mentioned the Framework modular laptop project. Well, Protocol's Source Code podcast interviewed Framework's founder, Nirav Patel, who formerly worked at Apple and Oculus. He talks to them about the business behind this, how he thinks it will take off, why he thinks he's done it right where so many people have done it wrong before. But if you're like, what is the framework? The framework is a 13.5 inch clamshell laptop that you can take apart and replace or repair piece by piece. There are four expansions and slots slide-in modules that snap into USB-C connectors, socket storage and RAM, and of course, a replaceable main board made up of the CPU and fan. You can also swap out the battery. Uh, you can swap out the screen and the keyboard and even the speakers. When you order the laptop, you can choose to order it prefab like any other laptop. You can still take it apart later, but it comes assembled, or you can get it as a kit, uh, which starts off cheaper, but depending on how you configure it, can end up being more expensive than prefab. Not sure about that. Prefab is still as upgradable as the kit, though. Uh, you just don't have to put it together yourself. The prefab with a Core i5, 8 gigabytes of RAM, and 256 gigabytes solid state drive is $999. The top of the line model prefab is 32 gigabytes 
of RAM, a Core i7, and a terabyte of storage for $1,999. And there's all kinds of configurable options in between there. You can customize it to your heart's content. Of course, because they're module, you can also change later after you've ordered it, you know, buy some extra modules. Uh, default pricing includes four USB-C module, but you could mix, mix and match those. Uh, you could have a USB-A display port or an HDMI. Uh, no Thunderbolt 4 yet. The main board's capable of it. They just don't have a module for it. Just keep in mind, there are only four expansion card ports. However, you can buy more than four modules and then swap them out for different purposes. In fact, Lori Grunin from CNET used that capability to change which side the USB-C port was on based on where her charging cable was going to be in a given situation because she was using the other ports for other things. All information on modules is published so that repair shops can actually perform repairs. They're trying to lean into the right to repair movement. Framework ships with a screwdriver that has a combo Torx T5 and Phillips head on one end and a wedge uh, for pulling uh, parts uh, apart on the other. Uh, also gives you some spare screws in case you lose a few. Some parts like the screen bezel are even magnetic. You don't even have to use a screw. Each framework module that is proprietary, you got things like the RAM that are, are just modules like, like you would have in any laptop, but there's some like the main board, for instance, that are proprietary and they put a QR code on it to take you to a page with info about that part. Helps you install it, know what the specs are, et cetera. No part is under another so there's none of that, like, I had to remove this to get to that kind of thing in a real machine. And yet, the whole thing is 15.9 millimeters thick and 2.3 pounds. It's certainly not the slimmest laptop you can find, but it's pretty average. Framework laptops are available now at various configurations with clear shipping dates on the website. Uh, so as you're ordering it, it'll tell you, like, ah, well, this configuration is in phase three of shipping. Most of those seem to be in October uh, when I was looking at this earlier. I'm excited about this, and I'll tell you why. I think the future of computing is probably modular, and I don't think we're anywhere near it yet. This is a step forward. Um, things have been tried in the past. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. We've come a long way. Uh, but I'm excited about the concept of I need to have what's best for me, and what's best for me is the size of screen or this much storage or this little storage because everything's cloud-based or whatever it may be. That's, the, I believe, that is ultimately the kind of choice we're going to want as tech users. We're not going to want the kind of choice that is strictly brand or sub-brand multiple models, which color all of that. Let us choose from components that are so well standardized in terms of assembly that anybody can do it, including me. Um, I would love that. I'm here for this. I don't know that this will take off like crazy. I think this is incremental and a step toward what will ultimately be the way this stuff works. Well, this is a nice step. Seems all right. M many yeah. have gone down this road before, though. Yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Uh, I, w I was going to say, so I'm not I'm not that much of a hardware tinkerer. I mean, I am in some, you know, facets of my life. But when it comes to, like, the modular laptop, it's that's not by itself a huge selling point for me because it's like, eh, you know, I, I don't know. I just want it to work, right? But the idea that a repair shop could be able to uh, fix my laptop more efficiently and more cheaply and and faster. That actually that sings to me. Uh, you know, ha ha having had a couple of years ago, my my MacBook, you know, had to go into the shop for like the better part of two weeks. And who even knows what they were doing? I, you know, it was it was a display issue at the time. Um, and luckily, I had a backup computer, so I was able to continue to do work. But that kind of stuff, I think, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, especially if, if for instance, uh, maybe the problem's your USB-C module. If the repair shop is like, I can repair your module, just leave it here. Keep your laptop. Right. We'll just pop out that USB-C module. Maybe they'd even give you a loaner module uh, in the meantime so yeah. you don't lose a port if you only had one. <laughs> yeah, uh, like a car it, dealership or something. All yeah. kinds of interesting things here. Now, these modules, the, the RAM and things that are already modular on most laptops, uh, those, those are not proprietary, but... The, the modules that are, like the, like the USB-C, for instance, those are proprietary. Uh, so that may be a downside for some folks. But remember, in most laptops, you don't even have the choice of pulling out that USB-C module at all. So it, it's at least a step up. And uh, it would be cool if Framework, because they seem to be fairly open about specs and repairability, if maybe if this got 
off the ground, they they started licensing out to to multiple parties to to make other modules. But I think right now they're saying, look, let's just get let's get people to buy this laptop at all first before we yeah. get there. This is how our robots are going to be. You may as well start now. I want different parts for different robots. Mm. Uh, speaking of uh, uh, trying new things that maybe will be the future, Microsoft launched passwordless sign in for all consumer Microsoft accounts. It was available for commercial accounts starting in March. So there's this has been around for a bit, but now we all can use it. Instead of a password, users of Outlook.com and OneDrive can sign in using Windows Hello Biometric Authentication or a security key like YubiKey, uh, a code for Microsoft Authenticator app, or a code emailed or texted by SMS. Uh, you'll not be able to use passwordless login in Office 2010 or earlier. So some of the older stuff is kind of busted up. Uh, Windows 8 or earlier, or remote desktop, or the Xbox 360 platform. Um, but that tells me right there that the the newer uh, Xbox platforms will indeed support this. I think this is a huge step forward. I wish the whole world is like this. Uh, let's help. This is the example it seems to be, and maybe everybody does this. Yeah, this is a dream long time coming. Uh, on knowalittlemore.com, we, we've done episodes about the Fido Alliance. Uh, there, there's been a long plan by multiple tech companies, not just Microsoft, to, to push forward a passwordless future. Of course, Google, a driving force behind Fido Alliance. Uh, this is a big step. It was I, I said the same thing in March when we announced that we, we had the news that Microsoft was making this commercially available. But at that time, I said when it really takes off is when everybody can do it. And this is everybody can do it. Yeah, there's a few older things like Xbox 360 and Office 2010. There's a security issue with remote desktop that, you know, right now it's not safe to do it that way. But honestly, this is great. Uh, Windows Hello works very well for those of you who haven't haven't tried it. It works incredibly well. But I like that they're saying, look, if you don't have Windows Hello, that's fine. Uh, we'll do these other options. I hope that you can make it so that you don't have to have SMS information as a fallback. I haven't checked on that uh, because SMS is, of course, the least secure of all of these. But if SMS is the only thing you can use, it's certainly better uh, than than not having anything at all, uh, and better than you know using the same password everywhere or forgetting your password or something like that. I, I I love that we are finally beginning to see the glimmers of an actual passwordless future. As somebody who I I I I'm very good at losing things. Um, something like you know you know a YubiKey for example seems like something I would misplace. Uh, and uh, that's not actually a way that I'm logging into any system, but the idea that passwords are, they're just not, they're not safe. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can make them safer. You can do your absolute best to make them as safe as possible. But the idea that you would have something on your person or yes, biometric information that you could use to sign in that is just better than a password is something that I think I don't know, let's say 10, year, 10 years from now, we'll all look back and say, remember when we used to do that and there were all these password managers and and all that stuff? It it does seem like not only the future, but uh, the future that's rapidly approaching. Yeah. Security keys built into your phone's NFC. Oh, yeah. Yeah. See? I just mm -hmm. want to wave my, I want it in my watch. I want it in my, uh, actually, I want it in my eyeball. Can I stare into your little sensor? and Biometric. And yes. All right. I'm Windows in. hello. It, it, like, it's, it's, it already exists. Forget your eyeballs, exists. your whole face. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> hey, folks, uh, remember we did experiment week at the end of August. Thanks for, for playing along with us, give, giving us uh, feedback. The first of the experiment week shows is launching Thursday, The Tech John, a podcast featuring Rob Dunwood, Terrence Gaines, and Stephanie Humphrey. Takes a second look at the week's tech headlines, but delivered from an African-American perspective. Uh, received so much positive feedback that Rob has made it a full show in its own RSS feed and everything. Uh, so, folks, if you are one of the folks who emailed us and said, I want more of that, go get it right now. TheTechJohn.com. Episode zero from Experiment Week is in there now. And the first official episode one will be in the feed starting Thursday. That's thetechjohn, J-A-W-N.com. Wall Street Journal's been doing uh, the Lord's work covering Facebook. They got a hold of a bunch of documents that have been running stories all week long. Today, they're reporting that in 2018, 
Facebook announced another change to its news feed algorithm. That's not the news. We'll get to the news in a minute. But remember, it noted publicly that research suggested that passively consuming professionally produced content was harmful to your mental health. And it wanted to encourage people to interact more with friends and family. Mark Zuckerberg said publicly that this shift of emphasis might reduce time spent on Facebook, but it was the right thing to do. Now, I supported the idea of like, okay, uh, connected with friends and family sounds good. I'm sure they have their other reasons for doing this too. And apparently they did. The Wall Street Journal's internal documents show that Facebook shared graphs and trends, noting that engagement, which was valuable to advertisers, was down and that this new algorithm would increase it. So yes, helped connect you with friends and family, but also made them more money. So it appears the change was made to increase engagement and get a PR bump at the cost of time spent on the platform. That was a fair trade for everybody, it seemed. Professionally produced content seemed to Facebook to be one of the things that lacked engagement. If you read a Washington Post article or a Fox News article, uh, he might not comment much on it. So they deprioritized it. Instead, Facebook promoted posts based on a score of how meaningful it was. A like would be worth one point. A reaction emoji, happy face, sad face, mad face, or a reshare, that was worth five points. And a significant comment, message, or RSVP, if it was an event, that was 30 points. Multipliers were added on top of all of that based on how close your relationship to the poster was. Family member counted the highest, a stranger counted the lowest. Posts with more comments and reactions started shooting up to the top of news feeds. Anger was more likely to get a lot of comments and reactions. So more angry and outrageous posts were promoted. That's always been human nature. While time spent on the platform did decline, daily active people, as Facebook calls it, rose exactly as Facebook hoped. And while users found content by close connections more meaningful, those benefits were countered by the rise of these angry posts. Publishers started to notice that their traffic plummeted, they'd been deprioritized. More divisive content they published, however, took off. In autumn of 2018, BuzzFeed CEO Jonah Peretti emailed Facebook concerned that the most divisive content that BuzzFeed published was doing the best on Facebook. He said, you are incentivizing us to make more divisive content and less good balanced content. The Wall Street Journal has internal Facebook documents that show a team of Facebook data scientists flagged Peretti's email and noted that misinformation, toxicity, and violent content are inordinately prevalent among reshares. Political parties in Europe, Taiwan, and India started to find it harder to communicate directly with supporters because their messages would be deprioritized and started to create negative posts because at least those would be seen in news feeds. Political parties in Poland told Facebook they had shifted actual policies to resonate better on Facebook, which meant they increased their negative content from 50-50 to be 80% of their posts. Now, okay, lots of negative posts, but were people more satisfied with their experience? No, a 2018 Facebook internal survey after the change found that people felt the quality of their feed had declined. Facebook did try to adjust. Its data scientists proposed multiple changes to reduce the algorithm tendency to reward outrage and lies. Mark Zuckerberg said he would support changes as long as they didn't hurt engagement. In April 2020, Anna Stepanov proposed removing a boost for long chains of reshares. And last month, Facebook announced it would expand some tests that put less emphasis on these kinds of signals for political content. In April 2019, one data scientist recommended reducing the spread of deep reshares. That's when you reshare something from somebody you don't follow. Facebook made that change, but only for civic and health info in spring 2020 and saw reduced false content in those categories. However, Zuckerberg resisted expanding it outside those categories because it might reduce engagement. Former Facebook employee James Barnes told the Wall Street Journal that the platform had grown so complex, he believes the company doesn't understand how its changes might backfire and just takes a gamble on what'll play well in the press. Y'all are angry out there. Let's do what'll make you less angry, even if it doesn't work. A 2020 memo said Facebook, quote, never really figured out why its metrics had declined back before 2018. So who knows if these changes would even work because they didn't figure out why it was declining in the first place. Overall, the Wall Street Journal paints a picture of a company that has employees that want to do the right thing, but executives that are worried about killing the platform if they overcorrect 
and a lack of any actual certainty about what works and what doesn't and what effect it might have. Whew. Yeah, that was yeah. a mouthful. I mean, I think one thing I maybe learned from this um, is that they they know how to steer the ship when the priority is engagement, as an example. You brought up engagement a lot, and how Zuckerberg doesn't want to lose engagement. So they know how to steer that ship into engagement. That tells me that they know also how to steer the ship away from problematic, troubling, or otherwise stuff that could be a, have a negative effect in a really you know a really measurable way on their users but they don't do that they they avoid anything that is an engagement but if engagement includes stuff that makes people behave poorly or at least gives them the opportunity to behave poorly which is just a numbers game they'll they'll do that and if i i i know that's kind of a simplified takeaway from a lot of data that they don't exactly share process of and all that but at the end of the day it tells me they do know how to avoid the the problems with uh, with Facebook and they won't because engagement matters more than fixing those problems. If there's a storming of the Capitol on January 6th, then they will for politics. If there's an outbreak of a pandemic, then they will for health, but only when they get public pressure. Right. I also, I, I found it interesting that uh, we are, uh, you know, as consumers of news, it's easy for me to kind of look at something and be like, ugh. BuzzFeed clickbait news, blah, you know, for 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 BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed's uh, Jonah Peretti to say to Facebook, hey, these are the kinds of stories that we're getting the best engagement on. Something is wrong here. We don't we're <laughs> uncomfortable doing more of those. We, you know, yeah. yeah, I mean, that 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 really tells you not only how strong Facebook is as a platform for sharing news and content, but but uh, but the precarious position that a lot of publishers are in when that is one of the ways that you get the most clicks. Yeah, this is why for years now, I've been saying you need to find out what the problem is before you can fix it. Because what will happen is Facebook will react to your public pressure, which may or may not be the right pressure point. They'll say, oh, you're mad about health? Great, we'll do it in health. But they won't fix the problem. The problem still exists elsewhere. Oh, you want to do it about politics? We'll do it narrowly about politics. But you're still getting everybody angry elsewhere. And I don't think Facebook causes all the divisiveness, but it certainly aggravates it. And if Facebook isn't going to figure out what the problem is, then Facebook needs to let academics have access to their data so the academics can do the job. Because right now, the only people who really know what's going on with Facebook are the data scientists within Facebook, and they're not allowed to talk to everybody else about all of their research. Facebook, if you really want to pressure Facebook, in my opinion, if you really want to pressure Facebook to do something change, stop being angry about them about whatever you're angry about and say, you need to stop people saying the thing I disagree with. Start putting pressure on Facebook to open up all their data to academics. Open up the data to independent research. That will let us figure out what's actually going wrong and get to fix it. Instead of just playing this game of like, we'll put pressure on Facebook because we're mad about something, Facebook fixes that, but doesn't fix the underlying problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I couldn't agree with that more. And um, it, you know, if, we were, if you guys are really going to tout that you're using scientific methods and that you're on the up and up and then not on the up and up that you don't have, that you've got the best interests of people, humanity and your reach uh, in mind, then show us, have peer review, have, have transparency. And without that, you're just, I don't know yeah. what, to, I don't believe you. <laughs> yeah. And you don't, Facebook, you don't have to do this. In fact, most companies wouldn't do this. I get it. But you're not most companies anymore. Nope. That is true. Well, who would like to talk about electric vehicles? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So EV charging, if you, if you happen to have an EV vehicle, might be easy for you. You might have a garage, even you have a driveway, maybe there's a cord kind of thing. That leaves out a lot of people who live in New York. <laughs> TechCrunch has, has a write-up on that company called Gravity that's converting a 29-space indoor parking garage on 42nd Street in New York City between 9th and 10th Avenues in Manhattan into a fast-charging hub for EVs. 
Cars pay the cost of the electricity that they use while they're parked. The company had to work with Con Ed to pull power from two separate utility ropes to bring in the 24,000 amps of power that was needed. And it worked with environmental architect Jasmeet Ranger on the building design not to make it just uh, some dingy gray space that you're used to. You gotta make, you know, a, a place you'd like to go. Gravity will also charge a fleet of Tesla Model Y yellow cabs overnight in the space. Kind of proof of concept there. And Gravity isn't the first to company to do this. Will not be the last. This is a new thing that people all over the world are going to have to deal with, especially if they live in urban areas. So Revel, which operates uh, Shred E-Mopeds, uh, opened a fast ch charging hub with 25 spaces for cars in an indoor, uh, outdoor lot rather in Brooklyn last June. And Gravity is expected to open its lot in a few weeks, and the company hopes to open five to ten fast charging sites in Manhattan over the next six months. Yeah, this is a uh, this, this is an interesting take on this. Uh, obviously, it's not you know 29 spaces is a drop in the bucket. That's not that's not going to fix it. But I think this is the proof of yeah. concept to say, hey, we want to do a bunch of these, and if we can do a bunch of these here, we can do them anywhere because it's New York. Uh, and by anywhere, I think they mean the other boroughs, uh, you know, Queens, Brooklyn, uh, et cetera. But yeah, I. I think it's a it's an interesting take to say we'll let people park and charge because anybody who doesn't live in a dense area thinks like, oh, you just charge overnight at your house and then you never have to charge when you're out and about. In New York, you might have to do that the opposite way. You might have to go park in the parking garage during the day and charge and then not charge when you take it home because you don't have a charger where you park it. Yeah, yeah. it's I'm, I mean, I don't obviously I don't live in New York City, but um you know, tightly packed uh, areas, uh, cities are going to always kind of be a problem for elect uh, electric vehicles to really take off. And um, even here, I still get a little nervous about it. I've got a friend who has a Tesla and he charges at home and then he looks for charging stations and stations and he's got it all mapped out and got this very careful sort of way that he gets around when he travels and that sort of thing. And I don't know, it's always been just this thing where like until we can really guarantee the ease that is every corner has a gas station. Um, you know, EVs are just going to not, they're not going to have the hold that we ultimately think they'll, they'll have, or at least they want as quickly, uh, as they would well, if they had this. The stuff, state of New so. York just signed legislation saying every vehicle sold in the state of New York has to be zero emission by 2035. So you got to yeah. figure that yeah. out. Yeah. If you're going to do yeah. that. Yeah. You, you better do it, it, I guess. It's, it's a pretty great business, honestly. Yeah. Start your engines, <laughs> yeah. so to speak. All right. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. We got a couple good ones. We'll start with Mike in steamy Dubai. Uh, Mike, hope you're doing well. Good for your pores. Mike says, I've been unsatisfied with the quality of the 7-inch and 9-inch tablet market since my Nexus 7 second gen gave up the ghost back in 2016. I got a Samsung 8-inch tablet that was okay for reading, but after about a year, it crawled to a snail's pace and Samsung stopped updating it. When Apple priced the 128-gig iPad mini as more than the 128 gig iPad regular, I just couldn't bring myself to pay more for a smaller screen. I've tried Amazon tablets. I've tried lower end Samsung tablets, but I find they frequently crash reading the Kindle app, but they're just too laggy. I love my Samsung Tab S7, but it's big and it's bright. It's like turning on a spotlight when I'm reading in bed. So the mini, talking about the iPad mini, is great for folks who commute on subways, like the fact that it's close to the size of a book and can take notes without the entire room reading your screen. I'm a dedicated Android fan, says Mike, but I will be running out on or close to the 24th to snap up a new iPad mini, Apple Pencil, and Folio cover. This moment has been years in the making. Congratulations, Mike. I finally, I, I'm glad you finally found your tablet love. Uh, I hope it all works out. I wish you, wish you nothing but happiness with the, you and the iPad mini. That's great. <laughs> I, I can sense the excitement. Yeah. He's like, finally, this is what I've been waiting for. I actually, I kind of read the email and I was like, maybe I should think about this a little bit more closely. Uh, it is, yeah, it is pretty great. Yeah. yeah. Not that uh, I'll they, be on a subway anytime soon, but anyway. David over in the UK said, as someone who has worked for airlines for over a decade, I see one glaring problem with Amazon One, the palm scanning tech in the concert venue. Remember we announced they're coming to the Colorado Red Rocks Amphitheater. Uh, David says, any event, whether it be concert or even boarding a flight, requires crowd management. Using palm scanning to verify someone has a valid ticket is fine, 
but then when through the turnstile, the person will need to make their way to their seat. This may involve staff having to direct the person to certain doorways, aisles, or staircases. Scanning your palm will speed up the entry process, but it assumes the person knows their seat number or assigned area and will remember it. This is highly unlikely. What is most likely to happen is after scanning their palm, the person will still need to check a paper ticket or digital ticket on their phone to find out their seat number so they can be directed correctly. This renders any time saving almost pointless as they will need to revert to a paper or digital ticket on their phone anyway. If you sent thousands of people into a stadium with just their palms and no other ticketing info, I would bet the event would never start with a pandemonium that would ensue as people <laughs> attempted to find where to go for their seat. Yes, David, no, they, they are not getting rid of seat numbers. Uh, they're not going to write it on your palm. Uh, the palm tech, as I understand it, is really just to speed up the line to get into the venue. And I, di I have to say, I disagree. I don't think the need to double check your seat number after you get in the venue makes the speed up pointless. Uh, for any event I've been to, the biggest line is getting into the venue, not getting into your seat once you're in the venue. Uh, so I, I feel like if that palm thing can speed that entry up, that it's worth it, even if you do have to check a digital ticket later on your phone. Agree. You ever seen a, a convention like a Comic-Con, uh, the way those things try to funnel people in immediately all at the same exact time? It's a nightmare. This would speed that up, and I think that's what they're trying to do. I don't know. I'm kind of with David on this one. I, you know, think of, <laughs> haven't flown recently, uh, but the, uh, I, you know, it, it always kind of, it, it always struck me as sort of silly that when, Everybody was getting checked in from from the desk, you know, at the gate, um, in a in a reasonable fashion, and then we all just sort of stood in the hallway for however long before we all got onto the plane. Sure, a lot of that is like actual physical logistics, like you know, people putting their you know luggage up top and you know getting into their seat, but. I know, I understand what he's talking about. I, I get the idea of like, sure, you get out of the gate, but then the bottleneck just happens somewhere else. I, I think the Red Rocks Amphitheater has more room for people than the airplane. That's all. Indeed. Say, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Airports, amphitheaters, a little bit different. Yeah. Well, listen, we love your feedback. Keep it coming. Uh, it helps us make a better show every day. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send that feedback. We also want to thank a couple of new bosses, Mark Deverall and Robert Osborne. Both just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Robert. And once again, uh, we've had a streak of this. Mark and Robert are picking it up for other folks. There's always somebody who hits a little financial skid or the budget gets a little tight and they're like, man, I'm sorry, we, we hear it all the time. I'm really sorry I have to back off my Patreon for a while. And so it's important for us to be able to keep doing the show for folks like Mark and Robert to step up and pick them up. So Mark and Robert have kept us in the positive Patreons instead of reduced number of Patreons. Uh, so we're really thankful for that. Uh, it's like a new hero every day. Really enjoy it. You are our heroes. Uh, there's a song about that, I think, uh, but I won't <laughs> sing it right now. Thank you to Scott Johnson for being with us today. Also a hero. Scott, what have you been uh, saving people on uh, outside of DTNS lately? Because of my heroism. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I, I spend my heroic days and nights uh, making a bunch of content. So if you like content, and I know you do because you're here on listening to DTNS or watching it and you're consuming it and you're going, oh, this is good content. I do other content that's like daily and weekly and everything in between. So if you're confused about any of it or want to know what it's all about, go find it. It's over at frogpants.com. And you can find me on Twitter as well, at Scott Johnson. Excellent. Well, folks, we're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 20.30 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. I will be off tomorrow, but Tom will be here with Justin Robert Young and the crew. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Finally, Bob hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>